to see Please be seated. Ryan's out of town this week in Michigan, and a lot of other people are out traveling and with friends for the 4th of July weekend, so we pray for them in their travels. But we are here to worship. And so many weeks we worshiped with all the seats empty. And so as we begin to slowly come in, I'm just blessed that we are together. And so let us pray. Um, for our nation, for this time of worship. I just pray that God comes in here with, with a new kind of strength and wisdom that we have forgot, forgotten to seek. It's time for something new. It's time for something hopeful. <laughs> and so let us pray for this time of worship that goes beyond what we could even imagine. So Lord, I pray for this time of worship, for the people at home, make their living rooms a holy sanctuary. May the Holy Spirit enter that place and within them and around them and bring them back to life. And in this room too, I pray the Holy Spirit come in. Pray the roof just come off. Christ enter in, Holy Spirit to enter in. All of God's angels enter in. Let this place be full of you. And Lord, a lot of us are in a place where we've stopped seeking and, and looking, and we've lost that little bit in us to say, okay, I can hope for something more. And so today, I pray you open wide our eyes, our hearts, our ears, so that we begin to seek you with a passion, with excitement, knowing that you have something so much more than we could ever imagine for us. Let us worship you anew. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Guide me. Great Jehovah, He'll come through this bad life. I am weak, but power mighty. Hold me with the powerful hands. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Open now the crystal fountain, wait 
Savior, I come, quiet my soul, remember, redemption's here, your blood was spilled for my Tempted and tried, human. The word became flesh, born my sin and death. And now you're risen. Everything I want tells you. Oh, 
lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Holy And please be seated. So this is the time we usually take offering, and instead of passing the plates, there by, back by the sound booth is something that looks like a treasure chest. So you put your treasure in there, <laughs> and God will take it. And I know God has honored every gift given during this hard time, and we've been blessed as a church. And so we give thanks, Lord, for the gifts, everything that comes from our labors. We give to you in full trust that you will use them for your kingdom and its expansion. In Jesus' name, amen. So prayers, there's so many prayers. I'm sure you have like a hundred ready to pour off your tongue. Just say the word nation. <laughs> How many prayers do you have ready? How many longings in your heart do you have for our leaders and, and the protesters and those who are in law enforcement? How many prayers do we have? There's probably too many. We'd sit here all day. So I lift up all the hot topic words right now and we give them to God <laughs> one because I don't know what else to do <laughs> because it's so heavy but mostly because I know God has truth and I know God has the power to unite all of us under the name of Christ and that is what I'm going to ask for in deep prayer, because I long for us to be a nation united under God. So we'll pray for that today. Also, some prayer requests. Um, Brian, as you know, went into the army for his training and got injured, but he has grit and he has stuck with it, and now he's back in training. He says, I'm not giving up. And so there is a new address for him. If you guys want it, I think an email was sent out. But we can make sure you get that. But let's continue to pray for Brian Holiday that he, this is a dream, and this is, this is huge for him to make it all the way through and change his life and to be in that place. So we'll pray for him and his serving our country. Um, we also have other prayer concerns. Patty Hamilton is having surgery on Friday for her sinuses and some things on her throat, which has been causing her so much struggle with her health. So we want to pray for her. And also Madison, who's um, going to have her mommy <laughs> in surgery. So we want to pray for them. Um, Madonna, Jeff Zirkel's mother, um, is, you said free. <laughs> she's she, but she's alive. She's not free. But um, no coronavirus, and she's in a good place. Um, Primrose. Primrose, yeah. So we're excited about that. And then granddaughter Liberty has so many casts and braces to wear, but um, the surgery is done from the tumor. And we pray for her for patients being a young three-year-old, restricted. So um, other prayer concerns to lift up. Okay. Okay, Sharon and Jerry Wilson. And then um What is it on? Oh. Okay. So we'll pray for Gail Linville. Okay, we'll can we continue to pray for Kim Greathouse. Okay, unspoken prayer. Yes. Yes. Sue Tilly. Okay. Um, we have some joys too. I know um, we have some special friend today, 
<laughs> and you're looking at me. But we have visitors today from Kentucky, and so I want to say hi, and I'm excited that you're here. Oh, yeah. Hi, Nancy. Yes. It's good to have you here, Nancy, too. Okay, so we want to pray for Cindy Garver, too, the pastor's wife from before, and she's having some problems. Um, she, I know she had an infection, but she also may have some other problems in her brain. Um, lift, we'll lift her up, and I'll find out some more information. Um, positive, you know the butterflies we have out in front? Brian's like, when do you want me to take those down? He's been weed whacking around them. I, at least once a day, somebody's stopping and taking their pictures with them. And so they're still bringing light and hope. So I'm thankful for that. Yes. <laughs> I, I, hmm? Leave them up. Yeah, I know. Leave them up. I said, as soon as I take those down, I'll make something else anyways. So. <laughs> but people are finding hope still in that and the symbol of the butterfly that our church has been using. And so I'm praying that there's there's more for us ahead in that symbol and what we could do. So, so let us go into a time of prayer. Lord, we lift up the names we've lifted up today. The, the names of people having surgeries, those who are out of surgery and healing. <laughs> those who have been corona free. <laughs> those who are in fear for their health right now. Bev Hamilton's granddaughter, who is corona-free, wanted to lift her up, because that was scary. Lord, we have so many names and worries, people who also feel alone in this time of social isolating and distancing, so we lift them up to you. I pray you enter their house, their spaces, so they don't feel alone, those who are sick and those who um, our healing. I pray that you enter their space and give them patience and peace. Lord, we also give you thanks. We give you thanks for new friends. We give you thanks <laughs> that a simple act of taking pictures in front of um, bright butterflies, in front of a church, <laughs> brings a smile or hope. We give thanks in a time maybe we feel like there might not be a lot of things to give thanks for. I pray that you point those things out to us so we don't get stuck in our misery. <laughs> and Lord, the big thing I want to lift up today is our nation. It was 4th of July. It was kind of a bittersweet 4th of July. We are still celebrating, but we also know the brokenness in our country. As each firework went up, my heart broke a little because I know the struggle we are in. And I don't know what to do. <laughs> and so, Lord, we lift up our nation in which we dearly love a nation with rich history, but also deep struggle. Lord, we give it to you, and we pray that you, you bring the name of Jesus front and center, this name of life, grace, goodness, grace, and love. A kingdom, you have modeled a kingdom for us that is so beautiful and is for all. <laughs> Give our nation to you, Lord, fully, knowing that you have big enough hands to hold it, to mold it. We're certainly broken. <laughs> Remake us. 
We trust you. We love you, Lord. You are our God, and we claim that <laughs> proudly. We pray the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not in temptations, but deliver us for evil. Guys, the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is a prayer song. Use this time to connect with God on a deeper level. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No king can compare your living hope. Your presence, Lord. And I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves. When my heart becomes free and my shame is undone, your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come fly this place and fill me. nothing worth more that could ever come close no thing can compare your high living home your presence Lord. and I've tasted of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord oh, Let us 
come fly at this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence. morning. Our scripture reading today is from Isaiah chapter 55 verses 1 through 9. Invitation to the thirsty. Come all you who are thirsty come to the waters and you will have no money. Come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money what is not bread? and your labor on what does not satisfy. Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and you will delight in the riches of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make you everlasting covenant. With you, my faith, love, promise to David. See, I... See, I have made him as witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will come in all nations. You know not. And nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. For he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. A while back, I got to go to New York And while in New York, I went to visit Ellis Island. And I didn't realize how fascinated I would be going to Ellis Island and looking at all the pictures and the rich history of all the immigrants. It said like 12 million immigrants came through Ellis Island to come to America. What intrigued me the most and and turned me on the most to seeing everything was when I saw this pile of the trunks and luggage they would bring because I have one of those in my bedroom passed down from my great-grandparents. And I began to look at it and I thought, okay, this is part of my history. Part of the tour was to go outside and look at the wall And in that wall, there are names etched of all the people who came through. And as I was looking at these names, I thought, you know what? I heard stories of my great-grandfather, Stefan Liptak, that he had come through Ellis Island, and my great-grandmother came over through Baltimore, Baltimore, both from Hungary um, in the 1900s. And I thought, what if my great-grandfather's name's on this wall? So I I went through panels trying to find L for lip tack. And I remember tracing my hand down the letters. And I hit 
the L's, and I hit Stefan Liptak. I remember tracing my fingers over his name, thinking a hundred years before my great-grandfather stood on this island with great hopes of what he was going to find in America. What an amazing moment that was to think about how he, he sought out this country seeking something more. After seeing his name, I think I probably stared at it for an hour because I began to think of the history I had just learned inside the building. My great-grandfather lived in Hungary by Budapest. He was in Albany, Hungary, a little bit below. And so he had to make the journey, whatever called him to make that journey and leave everything behind, family, the familiar, jobs. It, it's said that most immigrants left for lots of different reasons. And a lot of people in Hungary at that time were set in a caste system. Whatever you were born in, you couldn't be more. And so they would set off to America knowing they could be more. But the journey was not easy. First, they would have to have $30 at built up to even get a ticket. And he had to travel from Albany all the way to Hamburg, Germany to catch a boat. Now, how did he travel? 1900s by foot, donkey, or train. And it was probably all three. And in the 1900s, there were no prepaid tickets, so he had to wait around until it was time for him to get on the boat. So after that long <laughs> journey, he got on the boat, and there was first class, second class, and steerage. Now, I know he was in steerage because first class and second class went straight to New York. They didn't go through Ellis Island. Now, steerage was not um, the best place on the boat. Basically, it was in the belly of the boat, with no real seats, very rarely like beds, not adequate food or toilets, and it was dark, and it was the worst place in the boat to sit because things would go up and down. William Taft wrote about this in 1911 about steerage <laughs> because it would be full of people. They'd take as many people as they could because $30 a person, they're making a lot of money. He says, it is situated in the worst part of the ship, subject to the most violent motion. Toilets and washrooms are completely inadequate. Salt water is only available. The ventilation is almost um, always inadequate, and the air becomes foul. An unattended vomit of the seasick, seasick is there, and the odors of the not-too-clean bodies, the reek of food, and everything. The atmosphere is just horrible. Steerage is so horrible, it's a marvel that human flesh can endure it. That sound fun? <laughs> so if you think about it, from the port in Germany, <laughs> got on that boat and traveled, and the weather was nice, 11 days to Ellis Island. 11 days in the belly of that boat, only getting out to go on deck to catch their breath. <laughs> so those, those days in the belly of the boat, too, I also read, which was kind of fascinating, they, they circulated stories of rejection at Ellis Island. Sometimes they would send people back because of health um, and other reasons, mental health. And so the stories of rejection would be going around and people would get a little bit afraid. And they began to try to learn the language in 11 days, this new strange language. And also they would um, teach each other how to answer the questions of the guards and the doctors. And so they spent these long days just getting ready because they did not want to be sent home. And so when they arrived at Ellis Island, 
they, the, the passengers would get out single file and they would be disinfected because they all smelled bad and they'd have doctors who'd mark on them if they saw a problem and they would go through constant testing in order to walk through the gates and be able to get on the boat and go all the way to New York. So if they passed all of that, they got on a boat, on a cutter ship, and they were brought through the narrows of Upper New York Bay, and the first thing they would see would be the Statue of Liberty. A Polish immigrant said, the bigness of Mrs. Liberty overcame us. No one spoke a word, for she was like a goddess, and we knew she represented the big, powerful country in which would be our future home. Could you imagine what they felt after going through that grueling, horrible journey to get to this place? I wonder what my grand, great-grandpa thought when he saw the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> In fact, I wonder what my great-grandpa was seeking, what pulled at him so hard that he would leave his whole life and his family to go on this grueling journey. And all I know is that he was seeking something more. Our scripture today is about a people who are seeking something more as well. The Israelites were coming to the end of a 70-year captivity, Babylonian captivity. The Persians had overtaken and had said, yes, now you can go back to, to the land of your ancestors. And you would think this sounds great, but they too had to make that choice to go on a grueling journey to an unfamiliar land, a land that actually was now in ruins. A lot of people, a lot of people in Israel decided, you know what, I'm gonna stay here. They had gotten into society and gotten used to the Babylonians, and they're like, you know, it's okay here. I can't own land. Really, I'll never quite be a full citizen, but it's good enough. And they stayed. But other Israelites chose to seek something more. Now that journey was four months long by foot. Think about it, you had children and elderly along with you and your whole family. I mean, you just think of, of the caravans of people that would go through and then carrying some of the things they own. That was a four month long journey, plus with the harsh elements and animals and attack. But some chose. Why did they cho choose to go on this grueling journey? to a place that was in ruins because when they were taken into captivity, the temple was destroyed, caught on fire, the walls knocked down, there was nothing left. But when they went, they believed that they were seeking something more. And the reason they knew this is because of what the prophets had said. God's promises to them was all about something more. The poems and promises in Isaiah 40 through 55 lay out God's eagerness for his people to come back. God wants them to be able to have their own land, their own resources. They're having to buy water in where they are now because they don't have their own land. He wants them to have their own land so they can have their own water. And so this makes more sense when you start to read this. This is the promises for those who are coming back to Jerusalem. Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Why spend money on what is not bread? or your labor on what does not satisfy. I read the message and it says, why spend your money on cotton candy? <laughs> I thought about that, you know, that is interesting. It's like all ear and no nutrition. 
I will make an everlasting covenant with you. There's, there's a promise, my faithful love promised to David. They knew these promises and they knew their God and they chose to seek these promises for something more rather than settle for something okay. And the scripture goes on to point out that now is the time. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. So he's telling the Israelites that now is the time of God's blessing, not after the city of Jerusalem is already built. Maybe some of them are like, I'll go back after they get everything, you know, get the wall rebuilt, the temple. I'll go back. And God says, no, now. Now is the time. <laughs> but now, now is the time when there's the most risk. And now is the time in which we'll need a big dollop of trust to go now is a time when seeking is not so clear because you know there's something good, there's a promise, but you can't see it and what it looks like, but you know it's good. God is seeking them, calling them to seek him now, to seek him right smack dab in the middle of a grueling journey. So... When I write my sermons, often God will give me like a narrative, a story. I started to think about Fourth of July and then my great-grandfather, and I thought, wow, that's, that's a neat story I've never really dug into. And then God gives me a scripture. And honestly, I, I, I get the scripture, I'm like, okay, how does that line up, God? How does this line up? God's like, this is your scripture. Okay, okay. When I begin to research that scripture, the historical context, I always sit back and I throw up my hands and say, wow, how'd you do that, God? Story of immigrants journeying to Ellis Island. Story of the Israelites journeying to the land of their ancestors. Parallel, a grueling journey. And after I get that, those two pieces written, I often stop and say, okay, okay, here's the part, God. What is it you want us to hear? What is the piece you're wanting us to hear about our journey? I know there's something in here. And I sat for days praying and writing things down, and it wasn't hitting me. And then God spoke. <laughs> God spoke <clears throat> first in the, the, a vision. Okay, you guys want to hear this? So the first vision was, all of us were in steerage. Yay! I pictured all of us in the belly of a ship, all of Bethel, all of us in here today. I pictured us sitting on the floor in a kind of a dark room, and the waves were causing us to rock back and forth forth and some of us were seasick and some of us were very uncomfortable apparently none of us got first or second glass tickets sorry <laughs> all of us were in steerage and this was our journey and then God spoke in words he says no one chose to go on this grueling journey Sometimes you're put on journeys, and all of a sudden you realize you're on it. You're all on a grueling journey right now. You are thrust in this journey by the circumstances of the world. And yes, it is uncomfortable. It is dark, and actually it's very sickening. And it's full of the unknown. And we're all hanging on together in this time of political division and raging disease, um, unrest, financial upheaval, and distrust. And we're all being tossed back and forth, but we're in this place together, this grueling journey. And right now, smack dab in the middle of this grueling journey that we did not choose, God says, I 
want all of you to seek me and seek me hard. Seek like all the immigrants journeying to Ellis Island. Seek like the Israelites returning to their ancestors' land. Don't just let yourselves be rocked back and forth in a boat with no purpose or hope. Let this be a time of knowing that there's so much more. There is more. He wants us to seek something more. He said, pray, read scripture, pray again, lean on each other, trust again, search, ask questions, look for me in the darkest of places, hope, hope, hope that I have something more, for I have promised 1 Corinthians 2, 9. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and no what human mind has conceived are the things God has prepared for those who love him. There's so many scripture, scriptures that, that give these promises. So I wanted to go um, share just a little my great-grandpa Stephan's something more so he relocated to Cleveland, Ohio, where many Hungarians went. <clears throat> and he worked in the factories there. There were many factories ready for them to work. And he met my great-grandmother, who was also Hungarian during a Hungarian dancing. <laughs> I guess they would go and, and dance. They had eight girls and one boy. He's, Steve's not in that picture. But my grandmother, Lillian, was the youngest of nine. My great-grandmother ended up raising them not knowing English by cleaning houses. My great-grandfather, Stefan, died of tuberculosis at age 46, I think. So, but they brought a large future of people. I mean, I'm here <laughs> as part of that something more. And if you ever wonder why my email says Mokushka, it means little squirrel in Hungarian. So that's where that came from. I really feel like there's a huge significance in our seeking. Um, <clears throat> sometimes when we're thrust into hard times, our seeking and wanting to seek becomes more. But also sometimes we turn it off and just try to survive. Like we hold on sick to our stomachs. Like, when is this going to end? <laughs> But the people in Sturridge couldn't do that. They had to stay alive. It said that 10% would die each trip in Sturridge. They had to stay alive somehow with the hope. And I'm praying that's what we hold on to. And we're going to seek God in this time and know there's so much more and that there's this great promise for us waiting um, today is communion, and we can't serve physical bread right now at this time. Maybe we'll be more creative next week and figure a way to do it because it's just too dangerous. But we're going to do communion, okay? We're going to do communion in this steerage part of the boat. We're going to use our imaginations. In steerage, they often didn't have enough food <laughs> or good food. They may have not even had <laughs> communion elements. So I'm wondering what they did with their faith in that time, in that dark place. But I want you, us to think, okay, Bethel is in steerage, and we're going to a place where we're seeking more. We know there's more. And we're seeking to come together more united and to remember the grace and love and power Christ gave us and what he did for us on the cross. And so we're going to take communion together. So first I want you to picture the bread. Hmm. Ooh, what if we did like the Last Supper in steerage? Dark room, not much light. You can close your eyes if you'd like. Um... 
So I'm picturing Pastor Jeff Circle holding like a meager little crumb (laughs) that he has. And he wants to pull us together in this hard time. And he says, okay, guys, we're going to unite under Christ and remember the grueling journey he went on to the cross. And that cross, though it looked so gloomy and harsh, ended up being the best something more we could ever dream of. Hmm. And so he takes the bread and full hope of Christ's redeeming body broken for us. He breaks that crumb and all of us are going back and forth from the waves. (laughs) We're struggling to hold on. But we look to that crumb with full and certain hope and we give thanks for it. We give thanks for it. For Christ's body broken for us. And likewise, we took, I'm not sure, here it is. <laughs> Said they only had really salt water, so maybe he had a little bit of salt water as, as a representation. He took that salt water, <laughs> said this is a sign of the new covenant. This is Christ's blood shed for you. He poured it all out for us. We give thanks. And in that place, though we didn't have juice or bread to go around, We had the name of Christ on our tongue and the image of him on the cross in our mind (laughs) and the open tomb was the hope that we were seeking. So we communed together in this grueling time with full and certain hope that there was something more. And it gave us just enough energy to survive the grueling journey that tossed us back and forth. We gained back our grit and went forward together. We give thanks, Lord, for this gift of communion We lift up our brokenness, our sins, and we repent for we fall short so, so often. May your grace cover over all of us. You are our God. We give thanks in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The more I seek you, the more I find you, the more I find you, the more I love you. I want to see. Drink from the cup in your hand. Lay back against you and breathe. Feel your heart beat. And this love is so deep. It's more than I can stand. I melt in your peace. It's overwhelming. The more I 
I seek you. The more I find you, the more I find you, the more I love you. I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup in your hand, lay back against you. so deep it's more than I can stand I'm melting your peace it's overwhelming I want to sit at your feet drink from the cup in your hand lay back against you and breathe feel your heartbeat and this love is so deep it's more than I can stand, and I melt in your peace. It's overwhelming. I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup in your hand, lay back against you and breathe. Feel your heartbeat. This love is so deep. It's more than I can stand. I melt in your peace. It's overwhelming. Amen. Amen. So I remember reading a story about one of the inspectors doing a mental intelligent test on a Polish immigrant who had arrived in 1917, and they asked her, how do you wash stairs from top or from the bottom? And she responded, I don't go to America to wash stairs. <laughs> she had this vision of the something more, and I pray that we have this vision of something more. So go and seek. Don't settle for the okay, but for the something more. Amen.